Okay, let's get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Harp EDTK Technical Conference. Today we'll have one presentation and we're scheduled to end at the latest uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, the presentation will be recorded and accessible online once we've processed it. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type it in the message box provided in the application. And also please mute your mic during the presentation to prevent any background noises. Uh, today, Dr. Andrew Su from Scripps will uh, be presenting about articulating a big data vision for heart BDTK and cardiovascular disease. Without further ado, allow me to introduce Andrew. Great, thank you, Vincent. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. So, um, right, uh, uh, Vincent graciously mentioned my title here, and, and I want to just emphasize from the outside uh, outset that this is articulating a vision and not the vision. Uh, this is meant to be a starting point um, for more discussion and more ideas and so forth. So um, let's just jump right into it. Um, a lot of why I, I asked to, to jump into this slot and, and give this presentation in particular uh, was based off of the last uh, site visit uh, from our NIH program staff to the uh, meeting at UCLA um, a couple months ago. Um, so I, I will very, very briefly summarize, you know, really just these two bullet points that uh, I think that the feedback from our program staff was uh, overall very positive. Um, I think in particular they, they emphasized that um, we had um, good progress on many individual projects and components across the spectrum and good demonstrations of uh, technical integrations um, uh, between uh, select projects. Uh, among many other very positive things to say, I'm, I'm temporarying my language here just because I don't want to put words into our program officer's mouth. Um, so, uh, but training and, 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 and the data science, I mean, I think was all very positive. Um, uh, However, and there always is a however, um, the, uh, our, our program um, officers did uh, leave us uh, with uh, this, um, this challenge and, um, you know, to uh, essentially, as they phrased it, create a story that really unifies all of the many pieces of our very diverse center. And, and um, uh, Susan phrased this as a grand challenge. Uh, and, and my translation of a grand challenge is into a big, hairy, audacious goal, uh, a, a BHAG. And um, what does that mean, right? I, I mean, the reason I think uh, our program officers really set this challenge out for us is that, you know, with, the, with maybe one possible exception, um, you know, we're the only or one of the few centers that um, A, has a unifying biomedical theme, i.e. cardiovascular disease, um, and as well as technologies that really span the big data spectrum. Um, everything uh, from proteomics to data repositories to visualization through crowdsourcing and all of these other things. And so um, there is the potential of really putting that all together um, into one, um, one unified story. Um, so again, my, my goal here is to propose uh, a few straw men. I have three straw men for discussion um, that are frameworks that um, may span many or, or uh, many components within our, uh, our center. And I, I put them up there for discussion, for modification, or uh, you know, for the purposes of tossing them away in favor of other ideas that um, other folks have. So, um, right, so the goal then of today's meeting um, really is to envision what some of these cardiovascular theme use cases might um, look like. And, um, and in, the, in the interest of trying to go from, from A to Z, right, we really want to start with uh, cardiovascular domain knowledge and data sets. Um, we want to move through the various big data technologies and resources that are available within our center, the ones which I, I, I uh, partially enumerated uh, in discussing the last slide, but 
uh, some listed here and many others that I haven't listed as well. Um, also through big data technology, uh, technology and resources that are available in the broader BD2K consortium. Of course, our program officers are very interested in, in, in seeing the various big data efforts and the centers come together in collaborative efforts. And so there are a variety of different technologies, again, some of which are listed here, uh, that could uh, play into these unified themes. And then the output of this is, is, is getting towards testable hypotheses. Uh, and testable hypotheses that ideally are automated, reproducible, and extensible. Okay, so this would be um, the, the grand vision. Um, and again, to emphasize probably for the third time, um, uh, you know, the goal here is to, for me, not to be prescriptive about what we should do, but really just to provide some sample scaffolds that other people can anchor onto or um, that, um, that just prompt discussion of other ideas. Um, okay, so uh, maybe at this point I'll just pause very briefly. Um, Pepe, have I captured uh, the essence of our program officer's feedback and is there anything else you want to add? Uh, Andrew, I, I think this is fantastic. I, I, I think you did. I think the grand challenge as you stated, put forward to us by Susan, uh, it, it, it's really something that should stimulate every one of us to think through uh, what is BD2K, where are we going with all the various tools and platforms we have built. Uh, I love what Andrew has, uh, has done here. Uh, he's illustrated uh, that we could put the different tools together as an integrated platform to address a fundamental disease that clearly remains the number one killer in the United States and globally. Um, I'm asking you to join me to support what Andrew is trying to lead here. Uh, this is fundamental, regardless how our center does or not do, how we actually would advance our understanding of cardiovascular biology and medicine. And this is how we started. Uh, this was the foundation of our initiative to be part of the BB2K. So that, that's my words to throw out there. I would add that we could consider this integrated vision that Andrew has, as he has already opened up for discussion, is we could consider the specific details, how to implement each of the steps, as well as considering multi-dimensional integration with respect to either integrating data from top down or bottom up. And I think this is, this is a wonderful initiative and vision that Andrew has put forward. Um, I'm, I'm going to mute myself and, and let others talk. Thank you, Pepe. Um, the other thing that, as Pepe is talking, I, I, I would just add is that, you know, I don't think anybody should consider this as any sort of change in direction. Um, this, is an ex this is just taking it to the next level, right? I mean, I think for the first uh, year and a half, two years of our, our center, right, it's all about building up the individual components, and now the next phase is really just um, putting it all together, and, and this is, I think, the the appropriate phase we're at in the evolution of our center. Okay, so I am going to come out with um, three uh, uh, big, hairy, audacious goals, uh, BHAGs, uh, again, as straw men. So the first one really uh, is, is probably the most straightforward, and it's this idea of prior, prioritizing candidate disease genes from association analyses. Um, and it really leverages some of the, um, the unique populations and data sets we have access to within our, our, um, within our center. So as, as, as everybody I'm sure knows by now, um, uh, the University of Mississippi Medical School is a, a, a key part of our center, uh, both from a training standpoint and a, um, and a data science uh, standpoint. And one of the key resources they bring to the table is the Jackson Heart Study. Uh, the Jackson Heart Study is a study of um, uh, cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular health. Uh, the design of this was to recruit 
something like 6,500 participants from a variety uh, of different populations and cohorts, uh, entirely focused on the African-American population. Um, this was the design and practice. They got uh, roughly uh, 5,300 participants recruited, uh, and this was uh, 15 years ago. And since then, uh, they've gone through three very, very detailed clinical exams. Uh, they have demographic data, uh, as well as, as a, a lengthy, lengthy sociocultural um, uh, in interview process. So um, <clears throat> this is, uh, these are data that are available. And more recently, um, uh, genetic study and genomic study of these patients have become available. So currently there are uh, uh, 3,300 or almost 3,400 exomes and uh, with whole genome sequences uh, coming on the horizon. So these exome data, I'm going to just focus on uh, very briefly, are data that, that have just recently been published. This was um, actually uh, the, I, I think it's sort of the overview paper that was published um, just last month uh, in, in, in August. And this is the association analysis of those 3,200 uh, after QC filtering. Uh, let me see if I can grab my mouse. Right, 3,200. Um, give me a second. Okay, 3,200 um, individuals um, after QC filtering. And then they tested essentially, um, oh, they, they filtered all of the, the various variants that they identified. And they filtered for null and damaging missense variants. And then they tested that against 36 cardiovascular traits um, that were determined from the clinical analyses. And um, the output of that was they found three associations that uh, met their level of significance. Um, one was PCSK9, which is a, a well-known uh, gene involved in cardiovascular health. And we'll actually discuss this a little bit more later. Um, and then uh, HBQ1, which is a hemoglobin subunit that was involved in, um, in hemoglobin content in blood, uh, and then a variant in this VPS13A uh, with regard to, to red blood uh, cell distribution. Uh, I think they note an appropriate amount of caution is that PCSK9 is pretty much reproducing something that was already known, HBQ1 and VPS13A. I think the significance of those uh, still needs to be, to be validated. So, you know, I, you know, I talked a little bit with Jim, or emailed a little bit with Jim Wells on this, and, and to some extent, right, this is the first marker paper, but, I mean, there was nothing really uh, groundbreaking yet. I think this is really setting the stage, um, and, and the next phase of this really is encapsulated by NHLBI's TopMed project. Uh, and so TopMed, right, initiated in 2014, uh, to go beyond simply genomics, but to uh, also go into other omics technologies. And it was uh, meant to be uh, integrate many cohorts um, uh, and not just be focused around uh, uh, single individual small cohorts. Uh, these were some of the initial projects that were identified in phase one. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see Jackson Heart Study is a key one. Uh, Framingham Heart Study, another well-known uh, um, cohort and so on and so forth. Ultimately, <clears throat> right now, TopMed includes more than 30 studies and 75,000 samples. Um, obviously, the higher numbers uh, permit greater power to detect, um, uh, detect uh, more rare alleles and also alleles of smaller effect size. Um, so uh, this is a recently updated slide. So um, the, there have been joint calling of whole genomes uh, completed for uh, about 45,000 genomes. And the data for the first 10,000 genomes, uh, including the Jackson Heart Study uh, whole genomes, uh, will be deposited in DBGAP uh, next month. So these are our, our uh, data that will be coming online very soon. And I think um, it would behoove us as a, as a center to think about how we would um, leverage these data sets and augment sort of the existing standard association analysis pipelines that are already in progress and already in place within the top med consortium. So, um, so this, I think, is something that we can take advantage of. If I had to throw out a few ideas of how, you know, using the technologies within our center 
might be able to extend you know, this JHS and, um, and top med association analysis, my first idea might be to uh, extend to a pathway level burden analysis uh, using React on pathway databases. Okay, so what does it mean to do a pathway burden analysis? Well, in the, in the paper that I just showed, they already did a gene level uh, burden analysis, so let me cover what that is first. So imagine you have this massive data matrix here, every row is an individual, every column here is a genotype, so the genotype or the variant at a, um, at a given position and decomposed down to ones or zeros, and Y is the dependent variable, so this is, I don't know, cardiovascular disease or some other relevant phenotype. Uh, the most simple thing you do, of course, is a single marker analysis. You test the association of G1 versus Y, of G2 versus Y, of G3 versus Y, and for every one of those associations, you get out a p-value. Um, now, imagine G1 through G4 are all part of the same gene, okay? Individually, none of these genetic markers is strongly associated with Y1. But if you do a gene-level analysis, what you would do is you would essentially collapse all of these various uh, variants within a single gene into a single variable. So it allows you to say that, okay, maybe every affected person in my population doesn't have the same variant, but they might all be affected in the same gene. And then using this, you would do an association now here of the combined burden of, uh, of a given gene or a region and you do the association analysis relative to Y, and then you get sort of this combined p-value. And there are scenarios, you could easily imagine, where PC is significant, but none of the individual single-level marker analyses are, uh, are significant. So um, gene-level analysis is pretty common. They already did that in the exome analysis. I, as far as I can tell, pathway burden analysis is, 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 is less common, but the same principle still applies. So, for example, could we be using React on pathway databases under the assumption that, well, again, maybe affected individuals don't share individual mutations, don't even share individual genes that are mutated, but all have some dysregulation in one or more uh, pathways. Uh, that would be uh, one idea. Um, second idea is potentially moving beyond simply the null and damaging missense uh, variants. Okay, so that was a, a relatively stringent filter, although it's a common filter used in their association analysis because most commonly you're looking at uh, null, i.e. truncation mutants or necessity mutants. But given our center's emphasis and expertise in uh, proteomics, um, you know, could we also bring to bear uh, or, or examine uh, variants associated with post-translational modification, for example, protein phosphorylation sites, um, uh, because those also could be a mechanistic way of identifying um, or, or uh, mechanism, mechanisms by which uh, variants could affect cardiovascular phenotypes, and that draws on expertise we have within our sector. Uh, a third straw man that I might, uh, or idea I might throw out here, is to look at all the variants in proteins with an altered turnover, uh, altered protein turnover, uh, as previously seen in, in cardiac hypertrophy. Uh, so why do I mention this? This, of course, is a nod uh, and a recognition to this really interesting and um, uh, innovative uh, both te uh, technique, experimental technique, analysis strategy, and a data set that um, that Pepe and Edward have really spearheaded uh, in uh, culminating in this um, scientific data publication uh, linked here. So uh, very briefly, right, what they did is they use um, uh, deuterium as a way to essentially track the degradation of, uh, of proteins. So they've done this uh, plus and minus um, uh, isoproteranol, which is a uh, agent that induces cardiac hypertrophy. hypertrophy. Uh, they sample um, uh, uh, samples across a time course after starting this deuterium treatment, and they do it across six strains of mice. So you can really look at how uh, which proteins are 
uh, for example, turning over faster or slower um, in response to uh, isoproteranol treatment. And so, uh, very briefly, I mean, you know, this can be summarized, and I don't want to steal their thunder, but, uh, you know, 99 proteins so far have been identified with consistent changes in turnover during hypertrophy. So already we have a mouse model. We see uh, protein turnover, which is an important um, aspect of, of uh, cardiovascular health, as we can see here in this mouse model, and yet may not have worked its way into analysis of the Jackson Heart Study uh, cohort. Um, so uh, that would be a, a third way, potentially, we could extend this. Um, and perhaps a fourth way really comes back to sort of the technical uh, and infrastructure side of things, is that the Jackson Heart Study can be a, a you know, a, a prototypical example for us. Uh, we could use an example of, of how to build usable, customizable, and extensible infrastructure for candidate gene prioritization, understanding that gene you know, uh, association analyses uh, will be done across a variety of different um, uh, uh, disease areas, well, you know, for all of our infrastructure folks, how do we bring that together so that every time a given group is doing this, um, we can draw on sort of a, a common set of modules and, and best practices and things like that. Okay, so that is what I have as far as uh, uh, BHAG number one. Uh, really, again, leveraging the Jackson Heart Study and other cardiovascularly focused patient cohorts. Uh, moving from uh, the initial association analyses through to candidate gene prioritization through the testable hypothesis. Um, okay, BHAG number two here. Um, looking at mechanisms and treatments uh, for rare cardiovascular diseases. Uh, so we've, we've we focused, and everybody is well aware of the enormous impact of common cardiovascular diseases. Um, coronary artery disease, hypertension, stroke, so on and so forth. And these all have uh, important um, uh, biomedical um, and, um, and societal uh, costs and implications. Uh, so why do we want to study rare disease? So why, why would one, one want to? Well, first, uh, rare diseases are not collectively all that rare. So um, by uh, by the NIH definition, a rare disease is something that affects less than 200,000 patients in the United States. So it may percentage-wise not affect may, very many people uh, on an individual rare disease basis. But collectively, uh, given that there are uh, thousands of rare diseases, uh, the rare disease community uh, or rare diseases as a group affects uh, 30 million uh, people in the United States, one in 10 Americans. So um, they can be, uh, in aggregate, uh, quite common. So that's one argument of why, for why we should study rare diseases. Uh, the second argument is that um, for the affected families of a rare disease, uh, the rarity of it is, is actually not all that relevant to them, right? All of these families are in the process of searching for a diagnosis and treatment options. And just to, to under, underscore that and, and sort of make it real as to how much of an impact, I, I thought I would highlight uh, one uh, such rare disease case study. Um, this is a case study that uh, the family has been very open about. And, uh, and so these, this is an early um, you know, childhood photo for Alexis and Noah Beery. Um, they're fraternal twins. And early in life, they, they were, uh, their development um, uh, was was delayed. They had seizures. They had coordination problems, and um, and so they were diagnosed with uh, a rare disease called the dopamine responsive dystonia, or DRD. Uh, dopamine uh, responsive, meaning that their symptoms were improved uh, by treatment with L-dopa. L-dopa being a, a neurotransmitter precursor. And so um, this improved their symptoms as, ki as kids, but in their teens, um, they started developing uh, additional symptoms, many of which were considered life-threatening. Um, and so this was right about the time that gen whole genome sequencing was becoming available. And so they had their genome sequenced. And, and what, th what they found was this. So typically, DRD patients, uh, uh, dopa-responsive dystonia, uh, 
are um, have mutations in this uh, uh, tyrosine hydroxylase gene, TH here. And TH is upstream of the synthesis of dopamine. And so it makes sense. You augment with L-DOPA, you uh, uh, help the body produce dopamine, and that ameliorates um, symptoms associated with mutation of, uh, of TH. But what they found is that actually uh, these two twins didn't have mutations in TH. They had mutations in this uh, upstream gene, SPR, uh, sepiopterin reductase. And biosynthetically, yes, it is uh, upstream of dopamine, but it is also upstream of another neurotransmitter, serotonin. And based off of this genomic sequencing, they hypothesize, well, if we, if we give this upstream precursor, 5-HTP, um, then that may uh, offset um, any decreases in production of serotonin. In fact, they did supplement with this. This is actually a supplement you can buy in, uh, in, in the, the health food store. And uh, within weeks, uh, the, the twins were essentially asymptomatic again. Uh, this was a photo of them taken uh, last year. They're both off to college. Uh, Alexis on the left is a college athlete, as they document uh, on their blog. Blog. So, I don't know, it really underscores to me um, how genomic sequencing and rare disease can really be impactful for uh, some of uh, these families. So, um, so right, second piece is, is really that uh, it can be very impactful. Uh, and the third piece is that of why we should study rare diseases is because rare monogenic diseases can actually be very helpful in finding treatments and mechanisms uh, underlying common diseases. And there are a number of different example of this, uh, examples of these that have been uh, described in the literature. Uh, so, for example, uh, Gleevec, uh, this, or a matinib, the generic name, is, is, was the first uh, targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It was originally developed to treat uh, CML, uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia, and, um, which is a disease that affects um, uh, about 6,000 new cases in the U.S. per year. So, on the scale of, of cancers, it's very... Um, a relatively small population, um, but uh, in, under, in developing this drug uh, and understanding the mechanisms uh, uh, underlying it, um, then this was able to be repurposed and, and expanded to uh, treat uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumors, um, uh, ALL and AML2 types of leukemia. Uh, other examples are uh, Fanconi anemia. This is a, a rare, ultra rare disease affecting you know, less than 100 uh, people uh, per year in the U.S., but understanding the mechanisms here really um, helps um, under the understanding of, of some of the mechanisms behind uh, leukemia. Uh, neiman pick disease, a rare disease um, involving mutations in this NPC1 disease, uh, NPC1 gene, uh, which is a, a lipid transporter. Well, it turns out that this lipid transporter is actually a uh, is a co-receptor for Ebola infection, so something that is also rare but has broader implication, and so on and so forth. So a number of cases where um, rare disease becomes a, um, a model uh, by which uh, we understand new things about more common diseases. Um, the study of, 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 cardio, of rare diseases actually, I, I learned, um, has a, a long history in, uh, in the cardiovascular space. So, um, and familial hypercholesterolemia is one such example of this. I mean, back um, in 1973, uh, Brown and Goldstein uh, really elucidated this, this feedback between uh, HMG-CoA reductase, an enzyme responsible for uh, production of uh, cholesterol, uh, and regulation of LDL. LDL, of course, is the quote-unquote uh, bad uh, cholesterol, and it's one that contributes most to uh, arteriosclerosis. Um, so back in 1973, they elucidated this, this feedback mechanism uh, for their work. Um, you know, a decade later, they got the Nobel Prize, and in between here was the development of HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, the so-called statins, the first of which was uh, approved in, in 1987, and, uh, you know, a whole class of statins now exists that uh, collectively are, uh, make large differences in, in human health. So um, this initial um, study was, was found uh, in cells in patients with profound hypercholesterolemia, uh, very, very high uh, cholesterol levels, which 
uh, led to uh, the, um, the elucidation of this mechanism that has an impact on many other people. More recently, uh, other studies of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia uh, identified both activating mutations in PCSK9 and most interesting inactivating mutations uh, in PCSK9. The inactivating mutations which actually lead to very, very low uh, uh, LDL levels. And based off of these results, um, uh, the, the whole field developed uh, these PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, which have been just recently approved last year, but they're anticipated to be a, a, uh, a multi-billion uh, uh, multi billion dollar per year uh, drug market uh, because of their profound effects. Okay, so rare cardiovascular diseases have um, impacts uh, on more common uh, phenotypes uh, or common, commonly held diseases. So, you know, just to throw out uh, a couple cardio, you know, other rare cardiovascular diseases that perhaps haven't, uh, you know, people generally aren't aware of, but maybe there are big data tools that we could bring to the table that uh, help elucidate uh, some of the mechanisms uh, behind them. So. Uh, I'll, I'll just throw out two possible examples. Uh, first one is Romano Ward syndrome or long QT syndrome uh, type 1. Uh, symptoms here are, are partial or total loss of consciousness, uh, some uh, arrhythmia type uh, phenotypes, and uh, may lead to more serious conditions. The causes of this are, are can be mutation in any one of um, uh, six uh, different genes, at least six different genes. These are ion channel subunits, and ion channels, of course, are important for um, uh, what? Uh, electrical stimulation of, uh, of the heart. Um, so, so the treatments are relatively broad in nature, right? They're, they're not targeted toward this disease in particular. So you can either take beta blockers, which generally just reduce the workload of the heart, um, or you can have implantable defibrillators. Um, but is there an opportunity to dive into one of these uh, six genes, one or more of these six genes, to really uh, understand more about how these ion channels affect, um, uh, affect mechanistically affect um, uh, heart rhythm uh, and or potentially the development of uh, new treatments or diseases or treatments or, or therapies? Um, a second. Um, Rare disease that um, that I'll, I'll throw out is uh, uh, this cytosterolemia, uh, and this is the accumulation of plant-based lipids in the blood or tissue, uh, which cause uh, osteosclerosis in in adolescence or early adulthood. So basically, you have mutations in uh, one uh, of these uh, ABCG5 or ABCG8. These are the two that I've described so far. Uh, and these are the two subunits of the protein called uh, a protein complex, complex called sterolin, and which is a plant sterile transporter uh, responsible for sterile excretion. And so when these are mutated, uh, you get um, uh, uh, sequestration of these uh, plant-based um, uh, lipids. Uh, so what are the treatments here? Well, basically the, the, the primary thing is to uh, to change your diet to reduce uh, plant-based sterols. Uh, there are a couple drugs that are meant to uh, look at cholesterol um, processing, um, you know, from more common diseases that have some degree of effect. Um, and, uh, or otherwise, you're looking at, um, you know, things like uh, surgery. Uh, in general, uh, statins are uh, ineffective. So, um, Okay, so, so this is my pitch on, okay, or my, my new learning on uh, cardiovascular rare diseases. And uh, I guess the question is, well, okay, well, how can we as a center approach the study of some of these rare diseases using the tools and technologies and algorithms that we've built? Well, first, it, it's worth noting that uh, mouse knockouts exist for almost all of the mutated genes uh, available, uh, mentioned in the previous two rare disease slides. So we might ask questions like this. Um, are there any differences in protein turnover in these mouse knockouts uh, among the heart express proteins that Edward and Pepe have, have previously described? Uh, we might look at uh, what pathways do these proteins act in uh, and um, what's known about both the upstream regulators and the downstream effectors. 
to identify um, potential ways of, of modulating these defects more specifically. Uh, we might look at what other animal models exist and, um, and do they have known uh, or relevant phenotypes uh, to cardiovascular health. Um, we also might look at um, uh, data mining in, um, to understand what perturbations uh, have already been described that might increase or decrease the, uh, the gene or protein expression of these genes. For example, by mining data in array express and GL or in, uh, or in the analogous uh, proteomics resource prize. Um, and finally, we might, um, again, uh, under the idea that ultimately uh, diagnosis is only half the battle as far as uh, rare diseases, uh, we might look at the drug repurposing opportunities to find drugs that might be able to be repurposed uh, to treat some of these diseases. Uh, this drug repurposing is um, sort of a, a whole can of worms in and of itself, and so I, I really blew that one out into its own uh, BHAG uh, number three, uh, focused around the idea of drug repurposing, and specifically drug repositioning around uh, using knowledge uh, networks. Okay, so transitioning to BHAG number three, what do I mean by knowledge networks and uh, drug repositioning? Well, you know, one of the, the classic uh, examples uh, in this field uh, is, is, is known as, as Swanson's ABC model. And it's based off of uh, this article back in 1986 by Don Swanson, who was a, an information scientist, not a biomedical scientist, an information scientist. Um, and uh, who wanted to look for uh, uh, latent associations uh, in the biomedical literature. And so the, the association he published on here is, is essentially this one. So he was looking, or he, he, he stumbled upon the, this example, where in the literature in 1986, there were roughly 2,000 articles describing Raynaud's syndrome. Raynaud's syndrome uh, uh, has to do with... Uh, um, cold extremities and, and uh, vasodilation and constriction. Um, and there were roughly 2,000 articles describing Raynaud syndrome and roughly 1,000 articles describing fish oil. And these two things were completely disjoint. There were no sort of articles that discussed uh, uh, you know, fish oil and Raynaud syndrome uh, at the same time. But as an information scientist, what he found was there were articles or, or um, categories of articles that bridged these two concepts, meaning there were lots of articles that discussed Raynaud syndrome and vascular reactivity and blood viscosity and platelet aggregation as one topic. And then separately, there were also a separate class of articles that discussed vascular reactivity, blood viscosity, and platelet aggregation in the context of fish oil, right? And so uh, nothing that directly joins these two, but there are these bridging concepts. And this is the so-called ABC model. This is your A concept, this is your C concept. And so he developed a, a methodology to identify um, whether or not there are a, a statistical enrichment of B concepts and looking at specifically what those B concepts were. Um, and I hold this up as, as the shining example of um, information-based uh, drug repositioning because, um, you know, he ends uh, with this hypothesis that says, I suggest, therefore, that we consider this hypothesis that dietary fish oil might benefit Raynaud's patients, uh, even though, um, you, know, it, you know, this was essentially the first time that it had been made explicit. Uh, so this was done in 1986. Uh, a couple years later, in 1989, a group took, took, him, took him up on that. Uh, they did a, a, a relatively small uh, clinical trial, but a clinical trial looking at uh, Raynaud syndrome and fish oil, and they include that ingestion of fish oil improves tolerance to cold exposures, displays the onset of uh, vasospasm in patients with uh, Raynaud uh, syndrome. So it, it was actually, uh, you know, an information-based uh, method that led to a testable hypothesis that was, in fact, confirmed in a clinical trial. So since the 1980s, of course, lots of stuff has evolved in terms of how we manage information and the depth of what we're able to do. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight one particular article and, and, and class of efforts really spearheaded by Daniel Himmelstein, who, who's uh, a very interesting uh, uh, 
accomplished scientist, uh, really an open data uh, advocate uh, that we'll get to in a second. But he had developed and uh, you know this um, a class of algorithms around the analysis of heterogeneous knowledge networks. Um, so heterogeneous knowledge networks under the idea that we have networks of things that uh, encapsulate many different edge types. So not just co-citation in the uh, ABC model, not just protein-protein interactions as is commonly done, but also looking at uh, co-expression and uh, drug interactions and um, interactions with pathways and things like that. So in the context of this uh, PLOS computational biology argument, uh, article, they were looking at heterogeneous networks to identify disease-associated genes. And uh, this is you know, one visualization of that heterogeneous network. So um, as you, you may not be able to see, but essentially these are um, uh, diseases shown in a circle, sort of the class of diseases, all the disease nodes are up here, all the gene nodes are here. And they have um, 18 different, what he calls metanodes, which are essentially are types of nodes. So he's brought in diseases, genes, tissues, uh, various gene sets, gene ontology terms, pathways, so on and so forth. And he's put this, all of these nodes uh, down on a network. And he's also added uh, 19 meta edges. So these are edge types. Again, uh, the relationships between genes and pathways, uh, between diseases and tissues, uh, and so on and so forth. And this network, as he published it, had a total of 40,000 nodes and 1.6 million edges. And the basic idea is, can you mine this massive network to look for um, latent links between genes and diseases? And, and I won't go into the gory details, but the, the basic idea uh, leads to this idea of looking at, uh, at metapaths between different nodes. So here they've highlighted in the context of, you know, what are the paths that join IRF1, uh, a protein, with multiple sclerosis, okay? So there's no edge that directly relates these, but they find what are uh, called, as, what he calls uh, these, these, these paths. Um, so IRF1 is actually, um, let's see, expressed in leukocytes, and leukocytes um, have some localization to multiple sclerosis. So that's a path through the network, and that is this type of metapath, which is a gene to a tissue to a drug, uh, sorry, gene tissue disease metapath. Uh, in addition, there's another class of um, metapaths, which goes gene to gene to disease. So IRF1 is known to interact with, for example, IL2RA, and IL2RA is known to be associated with multiple sclerosis, and that also applies to many other different types of uh, intermediate uh, genes, uh, genes and proteins. And so basically, you know, his framework allows you to uh, look at the various paths between, um, you know, genes and diseases, to put some probabilistic weights on that, uh, that take into account uh, how well connected each one of these concepts is and so on and so forth. And uh, ultimately you come out with predictions about, uh, from an information management uh, perspective, how likely these two things are to be related. Um, interestingly, uh, uh, Daniel based his network on uh, this uh, paper looking at not um, uh, biomedical networks, but looking at co-author relationship predictions in heterogeneous bibliographic networks uh, by um, our BD2K friend and colleague, Jawe Han at uh, UIUC. Um, so um, there's some amount of um, potential synergy there as well um, in sort of the underlying algorithms and the extensions to them. Um, so now, you know, Daniel, in addition to doing that gene disease discovery um, uh, project, he, he's expanded this to drug repurposing. And so now here he's developed um, this Repetio, which is a heterogeneous network for drug repositioning. Many of the same edges, but also some additional ones. So he's added, you know, uh, 1,500 small molecules. He's looking at 137 complex uh, uh, common diseases. Um, you know, now we're up to 2 million edges, uh, so on and so forth. So. Uh, he, as I mentioned, Daniel is sort of an, an open uh, data um, 
zeal it, uh, and he's uh, he's he's done a lot um, as far as making these data openly accessible. Uh, everything from the data sets to the code he uses to analyze. Uh, analyze. Um, I, I should pause here for a second and just to say, you know, define drug repositioning and repurposing, right? So the idea here is that there are a number of compounds that are already uh, have had a, a, some amount of uh, safety studies done uh, either in uh, in vitro, in animal models, or even in human clinical trials. And so those have a faster path to approval if you're just looking for new indications. So it's essentially identifying new indications for uh, existing compounds that have some degree of safety profile already locked in. Okay, so um, uh, Daniel's done this in an open data concept. He's, he's done everything in the context of this, uh, this think lab. This is where he documents everything he's done. The link uh, to it is over here. So um, what can we do as far as extending this for PETIO framework in the context of cardiovascular diseases and maybe even cardiovascular rare diseases? Um, well, one thing we could do is we could take the uh, 1,500 compounds that exist within the Repetio network and expand that even more uh, just to a, a wider set of about uh, uh, 10 or 12,000 uh, post-phase 1 drugs and drug candidates. This is actually something that folks in my group are already uh, working on. Uh, can we expand the 137 common diseases that are in uh, Repetio? to rare cardiovascular diseases. Um, we can look at adding more node types. So for example, in the network right now, there are no concepts of variants, no concepts of proteins or protein variants. Uh, and those, of course, are, are, are of particular interest to our center. Uh, we can be adding more edge types. Uh, for example, uh, looking at the various phenotypes associated with diseases. Those can uh, often be um, good bridging nodes to identify uh, paths of interest. Uh, we can look at adding more edges um, using text mining, uh, using additional community resources, using uh, some amount of biodegradation. Uh, we can look at methods to improve data quality or the usage of data uh, by incorporating cell type context of the edges, uh, by looking at things like crowd-based validation and so forth. Okay, so this is where I'm going to end um, uh, BHAG number three and, and, and really start to wrap up. Um, again, the goal is to, to put out ideas as to um, uh, what might be these unifying themes for uh, the next phase of our center. I've thrown out three ideas uh, on how do we, looking at how we prioritize candidate disease genes from uh, cardiovascular association studies. Uh, how do we study mechanisms and treatments for rare cardiovascular diseases? And how do we use knowledge networks for drug repositioning? Um, and, you know, if I had to um, make a, a proposal for how we can um, transit, how we can treat sort of the next round of our Friday discussions and presentations, I think these are some of the questions we might uh, want to tackle. Uh, so given these three straw men that I put out, how can we, you know, how can you, using your expertise or tools or algorithms or, or related projects, how can we refine or enrich these cardiovascular research questions? So uh, really focusing on the use cases and, and appealing to those with uh, cardiovascular domain expertise. Um, how do we use the other tools and algorithms and data sets within HeartBeat 2K? Uh, to attack these use cases? How, can, how do you think your resources might be able to advance these three, um, any of these three um, these use cases? Uh, what collaborations can we forge with other BD2K centers who bring complementary skills and expertise? Um, and then, uh, again, emphasizing that, that I, you know, I definitely don't claim to, to have all, all the interesting questions here. But um, are there other key questions in cardiovascular research that we should be addressing or we could be addressing? Uh, really uh, top-down proposals for other scaffolds that we, we might want to anchor on, uh, as well as um, talking about just simply the pairwise synergies that you may see 
that can be set up that may, even though if you can't quite see it, right, may eventually contribute to larger efforts. So this is really building up the, the synergies between these various tools in a bottom-up strategy. So I'll say that um, uh, the next BD2K um, uh, site visit will be in March. Uh, the exact date is still TBD, but uh, it will be here in San Diego. And I would, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm gunning for the idea that, you know, the theme should be um, reorienting along, along one or more of these, uh, of these BHACs. And so we can really showcase how uh, we go from A to Z um, um, with all of our tools. Now, in March, there still may be gaps, and I think the gaps are totally fine. Um, but uh, at least part of the goal is identifying what those gaps are, right? Um, so I think we can definitely, over the next, uh, what, six months, uh, if I, I think we can make a really great progress chipping away at some of these questions. That's uh, all I have. And so I'm happy uh, to take questions or, uh, or hear additional uh, discussion of of these ideas. Thanks. Uh, so this is Pei Pei. I maybe I I could start, but if anyone else wants to ask question, I'll 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 let others ask first. Okay, so I'm going to get started. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much and, and congratulations on putting together this grand vision and it's insightful and stimulating. Uh, I personally I am inspired. I, I'm sure many of our audience are uh, uh, not just speaking on their behalf but to say we so much appreciate all the thought process and the vision you put together here. Uh, there are many, many things to process and digest. All are good, all are stimulating for the best science yet to come. Uh, just a couple of quick things, not a question, but more of a, a comment and confirmation from my perspective as well. Number one, Andrew, I am with you 100%. We should make rare disease of cardiovascular medicine as a focusing point of our future endeavor. Now, one definition is the U.S. definition, the government definition of what is a rare disease. That is, that it affects less than 200,000 population. Another definition that's learned from many of the genotyping and phenotyping that we have done is for any kind of recognized high impact disease like cardiovascular disease, if we actually zoom in to carefully study the genotypes, to carefully study all the molecular attributes, to carefully study all the physical parameters that can be measured and characterized, all of them representing a category of rare disease in the general umbrella of cardiovascular disease. I think Andrew's point is very well taken. We, as an informatic supportive platform, has both the benefits and the opportunity to look into different aspects of cardiova uh, cardiovascular rare disease at details. We have some of the tools and maybe could develop more tools to carefully annotate, identify different types of cardiovascular rare diseases that are actually information are out there because of their molecular attributes, because of their physical parameters. If we could get some of that out, that really makes a huge contribution to cardiovascular medicine. Um, the second point I want to echo what Andrew has said is, do not think what we do as simply annotation. 
or annotating the molecules or other parameters for the purpose of understanding biomedical insights, identify new drug targets, and identify future opportunities or hypotheses to be tested. So the annotation itself is an innovation. It's a very creative process. And I want to ask every one of us in the center to consider that carefully. So I'm going to stop here and let others talk. Thank you, Pepe. I think those are great points. Any other thoughts or questions? Um, if not, Andrew, I think what we will do, if, if it's agreeable with you, we will do this, this follow-up discussion, if you wish to, on different categories of your slides in details brainstorming continually for the I, I, technical cost. For, I think we should do it for quite a few more times to come. If you want us to sandwich with other technical costs, that's also okay. But we make additional efforts to brainstorm all the points you brought up. Fantastic. That sounds great. And I, you know, I think it also is, is uh, you know, a, a request of the presenters to really orient, you know, I think we've done, you know, a few rounds of this, so I think we have good ideas of, of where sort of each project stands as, as, as individual projects. But you know, where if these Friday calls could really focus around the idea of um, bridges to these use cases or bridges to other tools and technologies, that would um, I, I think be really valuable. And and I, I would also love it, right? I mean, you know, the Friday calls don't have to be the only mechanism. Uh, I would love it if if these spawned offline projects that had um, their own thing. So as an example. Right after the UCLA meeting, um, putting together the STSI team with the Jackson Heart Study team, um, you know, on, on a way to use their cohorts for a mobile app that that STSI is building, building up that, that's sort of the bottom up type of approach. So uh, identifying opportunities like that that go off and live and get discussed and developed in different forms, I think, is would be a great outcome of our Friday technical calls. Oh, okay. Fantastic. So, uh, Andrew, the, the other thing, um, I know you probably have a meeting to go. I do at 9 a.m. But the other thing before I lose to you is could, could you and I find a time to brainstorm of how to structure the next rounds of proposals? Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, and I know you couldn't make it to Denver, and Chunle couldn't either. But I'll see uh, Honey, and I'll also talk to him if we can find time together. Surreal, but that's great. If not, we're just going to have you and him talk, you and I talk, and that kind of thing. Get it uh, started because it's really uh, time we we do that. Um, I'm. I'm thinking of not one large proposal, but multiple large proposals that we could all each bear heads as well as support the others. Great. Looking forward okay. to the discussion. Okay. So maybe just uh, drop me a few time points that you have the next week that you could Skype. Is, is that okay? I I could do. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Very, I have very open schedules on these days. I will uh, email you uh, my my availability. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thanks for an, for the inspiration lecture. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Mm, bye. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, uh, so that concludes uh, today's conference. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, we'll send out an email about the, the topics that Andrew proposed uh, for the next round. Uh, that concludes today's conference. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending.